invite now Matthias Meyer, the second of the German community of this afternoon. So, and after that we have Timo at ten past two, Stephen at half past two, Paul ten to three. So it's a pretty dynamic thing. Matthias is um, on Victoria University and now at the McDamey Institute, originally from Germany. I'm introducing him like as a beauty contest, but I think that it will work. So, look at that. Looks like an old Mickey Mouse movie. You see? Punk rock, okay, cool. Good. Ready? Not yet. <laughs> it's an old machine of patience. Well, it's supposed that Ubuntu works better in all machines. Um, <laughs> yeah, maybe. <laughs> okay. <laughs> oh, no, so. it's, it works surprisingly well. The, the laptop is six or seven years old, I think. Okay. <laughs> yeah, yeah, it's a, it tells you that, oh, <laughs> warning, it might die any second, but somehow it's still alive. I don't know why. In the meantime, I've mistreated just this as much as I could. <laughs> Look at that. Um, All yours. Cheers. Um, yeah, hi. I'm, um, I'm a physicist by trade, so many of the things I heard this morning didn't make much sense to me. Um, but uh, yeah, I was, I was always, I was always very interested in, in, uh, in the computing sector of science. Basically, I always uh, have used computers since my childhood, which is quite quite something given I grew up in East Germany so we were kind of in short supply there but um, um, I've, I've been very interested in, in seeing in seeing um, high performance computing becoming accessible more and more on the on the office machine I have basically so there is a big interest at the moment in science and getting um, in, in computation everything is becoming computational computational biology, computational physics, etc., etc. So I wanted to point out a couple of things um, about the advent of multi-core, the, the arrival of it in science, and what kind of repercussions I could identify there. Um, I recently did my PhD here, and I'm now, I, I did my PhD with the McDermott Institute, and I'm now working for a company called Magritech, still in conjunction with the university. They're a spin-off company. They don't, they don't live very far away from, from the original research group. Anyhow, so the outline is a bit brief. I'm just going to show you a couple of examples of what scientists have always done with parallel computing. Um, 20, 30 years ago, with the first big machines to craze, um, they've always done multi-core stuff there, but there was a very small subset of scientists that did that. Now, what is the impact of multi-core in your office machine? What kind of impact does that have in science? It's a question I want to briefly comment on um, and conclude. So, just to show you some examples, that's a picture from Wikipedia on gravitational lensing. There's a, there's a guy at Victoria University, quite well known in his field, um, who does a lot of this kind of stuff. Um, what you see is um, you see a, a galaxy on the, on the top right sending light towards Earth. Well, we, we, we don't see the light from that galaxy directly. We see it through a lens. That lens is mass in between, which bends the light and thereby acts as a lens. So we see several copies of the same, um, of the same galaxy reaching us from various different directions. Um, and now the task is to find out what kind of lens was in between, what kind of lens caused the distortion we observe. So that's the idea in gravitational lensing. Now the computational way to approach that problem 
is to simply try out many different arrangements of mass to find one that fits well. So you can see where the parallelization is going here. Right? So you could either just brute force plenty of different gases or you just um, employ something meta heuristic like a genetic algorithm or something along those lines. So that's one of the one of those um, exemplary problems in, in high performance computing where you typically don't employ your office machine. Um, another one simulations based on lattices where you have lattice sites which have a property in this case spin up spin down simulating magnetism um, these lattices can be huge in particular they can be one three four D so they and various degrees of freedom for each property per lattice site and these properties propagate from one lattice site to the neighbors maybe only to the nearest neighbors typically but often um, now, in some cases, to, to neighbors further away as well. You compute some properties from there. You can compute phase changes of materials, and all these kind of things. It's important, very important model, the easing model here for magnetism. And these lattices can be massive, so they, they, you run into a memory problem on them, not just into a computational problem, but into a memory problem. And on top of that, if you split it on the cluster, you have data parallel, a data parallel array, then uh, you have a communication problem as well. So that's uh, one of these um, models that have been that have been uh, used in physics 20 years ago already on um, on parallel computers. Um, another one, Monte Carlo methods. You just have um, a bunch of um, in this example here, you, that's the, the aggregation of colloids, which are like little spheres, smaller than the wavelength of light, very small, very hard to, to observe um, what they're actually doing um, in, in a solution, and they bounce around the water. These, these spheres at some point aggregate and, and precipitate from the solution. You want to understand how they do it, what the dynamics of that are. You can use um, kinetic Monte Carlo for that, where you just pick a sphere at random, move it in a random direction, and see whether it kind of hits another sphere. And if so, then you know you could decide does it stick to it or not, or does it, if there's any electric repulsion between the two, that should it go the other way or not? Is the overall energy in the system increased or decreased? If it's decreased, then that's cool because all all systems tend to go to their lowest energy state. You accept that and move on to the next random sphere. If it's increased, then you accept it only with a probability that has something to do with the temperature. So typically, you are talking about millions and millions of iterations. So that's one of these um, high-performance problems where you, um, where you have a data problem. Like these lattices can be big. Um, and where you have a, a problem uh, on uh, you need just many, many subsequent iterations, and you cannot uh, jump forward halfway and give another processor that task to do because it doesn't know what the previous state was. So, um, again, something to think about in terms of how to parallelize these things properly. Um, one of the favorites, molecular mechanics. Um, many, many atoms all interacting with one another, similar to the Monte Carlo, but etc. Uh, in, different in the sense that that you don't move between lattice sites. Now you can move at any continuous variable, right, at any position in 3D space. These atoms all interact. What is shown here is uh, the uptake of a, of a little metal palladium cluster into a carbon nanotube, which is important to understand um, how these carbon nanotubes grow, which is important, again, because these carbon nanotubes have very funky properties, and we all want to have as much things made of carbon nanotubes as we can think of. We just don't know it yet. Um, so these uh, molecular mechanics, how, the question here, again, is how to parallelize them properly. How do you assign, for example, one way be to just assign, assign one set of atoms to one processor, another set of atoms to another, but now you want to do that as efficiently as possible um, that, that's one of the things that comes to mind on how to parallelize these, um, 
these problems. Um, people have done it, though. For example, fairly recent. Uh, I don't know why that was published in the Journal of High Explosive and Organic Materials, but um, nonetheless, yeah, it's cool. Yeah. Um, 320 billion atom simulation, that's massive from, from, a, from a computational and also on a scientific scale, that's massive. They basically can simulate almost bulk metal. Um, bulk in the sense that it's a little cube with micrometer length scale, which is still fairly small, but uh, from a scientific point of view, humongous. Um, so, yeah, that's, that's the current edge there. Um, another one, quantum chemistry. Sounds, sounds funky, but what it is is you use quantum theory to simulate chemical properties of molecules, for example. This is a molecule, benzene thiol. What are plotted here are various different isosurfaces of, um, um, of the electro overall electron density. It's actually not just plotted. I used Blender as well. Um, so that's, you simulate the electron density. You can infer from the electron density a, a large amount of properties. You can apply perturbations, like how does that density change if you apply a field in one direction or an electric field in the other direction? What happens if one of the natural perturbations, one of the natural vibrations in the molecules um, uh, is, uh, is undergoing? What kind of perturbation do you see then? You can compute what color the element has, what wavelength it scatters, etc. So we can learn a whole bunch of things. We can even compute things about molecules we can't synthesize, so that we, we don't know whether they exist, basically, uh, except in the, in the computer. We haven't managed, chemists haven't managed to make it, but we know, you know, potentially it's out there. Um, the problem being, with all these problems, that um, some of them, uh, what I've shown you obviously are the results, so we can compute them. But in basically all of them, we wish for more. We basically say, hey, I want to compute a molecule um, that is 10 times that size, and I want to have it sitting on a, on, on a lattice of metal atoms that is a micrometer wide or something like that on each edge. So um, at the moment, that's completely out of the question at that level of theory. Um, and these algorithms, some of them scale well, some of them scale not so well. There is a huge amount of work to be done in terms of parallelization. Um, it's hard enough to wrap your head around the, the uh, physical theory. Then applying that to how to compute it is basically the next level. Um, and there's a lot of work that, that could be done there. So coming to the second point, highly scientific graph that I drew by hand. Um, um, the number of people um, that have a particular computational literacy. Um, so that's kind of the argument I want to make here. There are many, 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 many problems that we are solving in science. Um, but um, the question is, should scientists do more? Um, because if you look at the average person, I would argue you get something like that. You get, you get a whole bunch of people who can find the on-off button. But you can get only very, very few who, who are going to install Gen2 on their laptops. Um, now, with, with scientists, in relative terms, you'd expect a little bit more. You'd expect a few more to be able to do a little bit of programming who know Fortran or who have at least heard that there are more than one, possibly more than one core in a computer. Um, but what you get instead of, of that uh, slightly darker blue curve, what you get is that. <laughs> this, is, this is what I find you get. You get a whole bunch of people who know the on-off button, who can do Word and Excel, and then, and then it pretty quickly goes into a valley, where I call it the valley of willful ignorance, where they basically say, I don't want to know about that. I've got other things to do. I've, the scientists work very long hours, often there on the weekend, and they just, they just want to mask out things that they think they, are, they shouldn't be interested in because it's a waste of their time. It's publish and perish in science. You need to publish as quickly as you can and as much as you can. Otherwise, you will not get your next appointment or not your tenure or whatever. Um, uh, Matthias, the only thing that you need to scale is time. <laughs> yes. 
I hope so. Um, no. <laughs> but um, give me a thirty seconds wrap up and impress us. Right. <laughs> um, the uh, after the what I call the, the that valley of willful ignorance, you get these people over here, which have always which have always been interested in these kind of things. These are the the physicists, scientists who've always been interested in computers. So um, we've done that 20 years ago, basically, before things arrived. Um, now the question is what to do with that situation. One of the key points is education. So my message to you guys is whenever you can identify a problem that can be parallelized, and you have something like uh, threading building blocks or view-oriented this or parallel programming, then, then why don't you do some outreach and try to get in touch with scientists and say, hey, I know how to do that. I know how to speed up your program by a factor of 10. Um, and and um, thereby, I can advocate how cool my system is. You get your, your publication. And you know, it's give and take. You all win. Um, so that's, that's one thing. Uh, outreach. Please do it if you can. Um, I appreciate it. <laughs> um, I'm, I'm terribly sorry because uh, it, Running out of time? Uh, yeah. No, you're already run. But uh, what about if you go to the last slide? Right. Straightforward. Right. Okay. So um, what I identify um, as, as the conclusion, basically, um, in, in, in high-performance computing, we're very strongly problem-dependent on how to parallelize things or not. Um, we need some true computational scientists who only focus on that. Um, you need funding for that. Then with every office computer having two or four cores or in the future more, you have a whole bunch of idle hardware. How to use that? There are the Boeing project and the condo project, for example. We need more people to do that. So um, education um, will help that, but you need to find funding for that. And one way to do it would be if, if uh, compute programmers would outreach more to science and say, hey, let's solve that problem. May, let me propose you that to discuss this at the birth of a feather. Yeah. And may I ask you guys to join me to say thank you to thank you. Thank you. <laughs> I'm not sure what I'm doing here, but that's my name. So well, you, 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 you so <laughs> that's that's to blame me for <laughs> just stop that. Timo, our next speaker will be on scope of Linux mobile devices. Um, we have this couple of seconds of change with machines. And I, there are a few guys in the back. I, there are a lot of seats here empty. Um, I think that I told you that it will be 10 to 5 a panel about the topic of the mini conference. Timo is from Germany. I think that is the, his third visit to New Zealand. He will tell us a little bit about that. And uh, I think that he told me that he studies in a university with a name that I cannot pronounce, but <laughs> with the first professor in open source in Germany. Is that right? Yes, that's right. So okay. I was just getting the laptop. And then when I found that name of that professor, and I think that wrote something on, on his blog, someone from Wellington answered, oh, I know that guy. So that just shows that we are a small family. All yours. Thank you, Nicholas. So uh, let me quickly introduce myself. I'm trying to catch up the couple of minutes we just lost. But, uh, continue on where Matthias stopped, so I'll tell you how we can use the idle resources for mobile devices. Um, I'm working for SUSE and Novell for five years now, and last November I've switched to part-time in order to follow my PhD uh, at the University of Erlangen in Nuremberg. That, in this case, has nothing to do with the programming language Erlangen, which is coming from the Dutch guy, I think. So um, if we look at mobile devices, we can 
a look at those two examples. One is a prototype from a company called Xerox, built in or planned in 1968. And another one is an actual product, which is from a company called Little. It's a web book, which was um, sold in 2009, since 2009. And I was pretty amazed when I saw these two pictures that uh, we have like 40 years between those two pictures. And I was wondering, what did we achieve? What did we do? So actually, uh, we reached, uh, we achieved a lot. If we look at the laptops and PDAs, those are basically the systems I'm defining as mobile devices. Um, we started off with, uh, with the Osborne one in 1980, and we've come a far away until we now have uh, Android devices, small pocket-sized computer who can do anything now all they left. Yes, please? Uh, I think the Osborne <coughs> 1 wasn't even shipped with a battery, but there was a second company which uh, sold a battery as a um, third-party accessoire, and I think that was pretty huge. That's 1968. Oh, that was 1968. That was a prototype. They didn't even build it. <laughs> so um, today's talk will be uh, split into three parts um, about what we have achieved, what we are currently doing, what, where we have failed, and what we are going to do tomorrow. So each, uh, I have um, looked at the numbers, at the plain numbers, facts, and factors of mobile computing during the last years, and we see a huge amount increasement in clock speed, RAM, storage, and bandwidth. However, there's also another number where we dramatically have failed, and that's battery life. If we look at battery life, we only improved by the factor of 10 compared to uh, bandwidth, which was increased by the factor 10 to the power of 6. So it's obvious we have a problem with battery life, and that, that didn't went unnoticed. So if we look at the um, first spy shot which went onto the internet in December last month, people in, uh, of the new Google phone, people immediately were concerned about battery life. They were not concerned about the, the features the, my, uh, the device might have, but they are only, only concerned about battery life. And that can conclude to the, fact, uh, to the uh, thing that we have a common problem for both PDAs, phones, and laptop computers. It's battery life. So when I was thinking about what we could improve, I first looked at our common power management stack, which I've shown here. So if we split the software into the Linux kernel part and the user space part, we have a lot of tiny bits which actually do the power management for the device we are running. So we have device drivers care, taking care of the hardware power management functionality. We have ACPI on the x86 architecture for power management features. Um, we have a couple of governors driving the CPU frequency and a lot, a lot of other stuff in the Linux cloud. On the user space side, we have, again, a lot of software running like a policy daemon, which is controlling and saying which user is allowed to do what functionality on the power management. We have a lot of other code like idle detection, graphical interfaces. So we do a whole lot of stuff there. One problem is that this stack is quite complex and it's fragile. So if we break one of the things, for example, a simple application user space, which is needlessly polling for a, a device on a device, we, uh, we cannot do much in below the stack in the software, firmware, or hardware to, to, uh, to fix it. So we have to fix application. And that's what I and others in this area have been doing over the last years. However, I'm advocating that this is not enough because all this is only bringing the, the factor 10, and that's just not enough. Um, if we look at the characteristics of network links, which are utilized by mobile devices, I thought that there might be a chance that we can do better by utilizing network links. So if we look at um, the past and present of the characteristics of network links, so uh, it used to be an impermanent connection we had to deal with. We, it was very low bandwidth and it was very expensive with regard to money, and um, that has changed. It, had, it has improved, so we have permanent connection to at least one link, like GSM, 3G, Wi-Fi, I don't know what. We usually have quite high bandwidth, so we can really utilize the link, 
and it's gotten very cheap. So at least in Europe, we are used to a flat rate, so fixed price for a line, even if it's a mobile one. Um, but what, ha what hasn't changed is the high power drain of the network link. So whenever we are receiving data or sending data, we always drain a lot of power. Oh, sorry. Um, so all what I'm saying is by this shift from the past to the present and changes with to, the, uh, to the characteristics of network links, uh, we, we have a shift from local I.O. to network I.O. All our, of our web applications we are today using are all network bound. They all need a net network link, otherwise they are only a functional, uh, they only provide limited functionality or no functionality at all. Um, but this is not only giving us a new challenge, but also new opportunities for power management, and that's what I'm showing you on the next slide. So that's a regular operation mode of peer-to-peer uh, -peer network, for example, where we have a mobile device participating in a peer-to-peer -peer environment, sending and receiving data from other network nodes, and all those network uh, links will train the power. So that's the problem we have to face and to fix. Uh, we have come up with a concept called the early bird concept. Let me spend a few words on it. The early bird concept is a, it's a smart connector between the mobile device and the network nodes, and it, it is able to supervise the, the mobile device in uh, specific parts, and it's also able to take decisions on behalf of the mobile device. It's an early bird. It's early because it does early evaluation, then has uh, take some early assumptions and does early decisions. Um, you can imagine there's a request coming from a network node outside, and the early bird is simply receiving this request, and at that point it can do an evaluation of the request, it can assume whether it makes sense to pass the request to the mobile device or not, and then take a decision. And let me show you how this works in the previous environment. So we have the, the early bird as a uh, supervisor for the mobile device, and we have still one link which is training a lot of energy. That's the link between the early bird and the mobile device itself. And we have other links. Those are the ones which do not drain any power from our device because the early bird is part of the wired network and doesn't, isn't uh, battery powered. So in this case, if we can reach something like that where we can proxy the traffic and somehow to save energy, we, we, are, we are good. Um, I have some uh, data to show you for expected savings. Um, if we take a usual netbook powered with an Atom processor, we can expect it to uh, consume about 7.5 watts when it's idle. Um, I am expecting to uh, 1.5 watts more in power, power consumption if we are either receiving or transmitting data. That is not only required for the network link, but also you can imagine that whenever we have traffic coming from a network link, we also cannot stay in a deep sleep state. So the CPU needs to wake up and, and storage device needs to be running. So we have a problem because we need to power more devices of the device. Um, also, if we are receiving and sending data, I'm just assuming to, uh, to consume about 10 watts. So if you look at the task we should perform, it's an easy one, just perform it on a mobile device, and you will see some similar results. If we uh, sh uh, should participate in a peer-to-peer -peer environment, downloading 100 megabytes of data at a link speed of about 100 ki kilobytes per second, we can expect to be finished after around 16, 60 minutes. And I will now show you the, the difference between using um, the device with an early bird and without an early bird. So at the top, you see a red line which shows the, the power consumption over the time without the early bird. So if we kick off the, uh, the task, we first download and upload data because we don't have an early bird which is helping us. After 60 minutes, we are done, and at that point, we are chopping down in power consumption because we only need to upload, not, not to uh, download anymore. Um, if we compare that to the, green, uh, to the blue graph, when we use the early bird, we only have to download in the beginning because every data we are downloading is being recognized by the early bird. The early bird can, um, 
cache the data, and when another network node is requesting data from the mobile device, it simply doesn't get the request to us, but is answering instead of us. And that's why we only utilize download. After 60 minutes, we are done, and the early bird can go down to its uh, idle state because we don't have to download and don't have to upload any data. So that's the expected savings. Um, I've written down the numbers. It's 29 watt minutes, watts minute, and uh, it's around 12%. However, I'm advocating that this is not the only uh, thing we could do with the early bird. We also have other plans, bigger plans, and that's why I'm here today. Um, I'm advocating that we, we should really um, uh, push out resource intensive tasks from our mobile devices to, for example, idle computers in the near environment. So if we have some idle computers in this room, you can simply run an early bird instance on this computer and transfer that task to this computer, let it compute, and simply return the result afterwards to the mobile device. Also, another possibility would be the speculative execution of tasks, where we simply try out a couple of different execution paths on the early bird, and we recognize, okay, this one is the most efficient one. Let's give this one as a scheduling information to the mobile device, and then the mobile device can use that information for the, uh, the execution, which is either the quickest or is training uh, the least power. So let me summarize what I've been talking about. First of all, local power management is no longer enough. I'm advocating the use of network links for, for pushing out uh, um, jobs to other devices. So we should utilize the resources in our distributed environments. This will help us to gain energy savings. And we can use either those savings for quick execution on the mobile device or longer battery life. Last but not least, I'm planning to extend this concept in order to get a possibility of remote execution on network nodes which are not battery bound. So when we look at today's prototype, here's one from OLPC. Uh, I'm really looking forward to where we are in 40 years from now. Thank you. Fantastic, Timo. <laughs> we have time for a short question or two yes Sorry, before you answer the question, may I ask you just to do the swap? So, Stephen, could you please do that? Um, the question was whether, uh, first part was um, whether the device and the, uh, the server itself need the software. Yeah, yeah okay. of course. Yes. What if somebody gives you a virus, gives the process machine a virus? The whole thing will be something where you need a... a uh, a decent amount of work for the authentication and also protection. If we think of early birds being shared by a couple of people, then you also have to make sure that the privacy of the data is respected. Also, um, on the other hand, it gives you new, po new possibilities because if you build a trusted environment out of an early bird and a mobile device, it would even be po uh, possible to do cryptographic uh, executions on the early bird device and don't have to pass it out to cloud environments where you cannot trust anyone. So there's amount, a lot of work to get those bits right. Any other question? Timo, thank you very much again. Thank you. Well done on your time. Matthias, don't take it personally. <laughs> <So>. <laughs>